right, guys. So welcome to week 14. This is your final lecture for Pharmacology 110. I know you guys are so excited. Um, I'm excited for you. I know you guys have worked very, very hard this semester, and it's time for you to have a nice break, enjoy some time with your families, decompress. So let's get started. So Tonight, we're going to be talking about oxygenation. We're going to do a little review about the lower respiratory tract, the upper respiratory tract. We're also going to talk about medications that we give for um, issues that we see in the upper respiratory area and the lower respiratory area. So this is the respiratory tract. I grabbed this right from your book. Um, we have the upper respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract. We know that our respiratory tract in general, its function is to bring oxygenation into the body. Um, once it gets in there, it also allows for the exchange of all those gases. It's going to expel the carbon dioxide and other waste products that are in our body. So the structures of our upper respiratory um, system are our nose and our nasal cavity, our sinuses, our pharynx, our larynx, our trachea, and our bronchi. So our upper respiratory tract does have protective features to it to try and keep things that we don't want in our respiratory tract out. So we have hairs in there that act as a filter to filter the air and try and catch some of those unwanted particles. We have what we call goblet cells, which produce mucus. Um, when they produce mucus, it allows it to be able, the mucus will trap all of the unwanted material. We have cilia inside there that helps move that trapped material um, up towards our throat so that we can swallow it. And then um, the blood supply that's close to the surface in our body will warm the air and it adds humidity to um, when we add humidity, it helps to improve our gas exchange and that gas movement through the upper respiratory tract. Um, sometimes we cough and we sneeze. Those reflexes also help clear our airways. So when we cough, what happens is we see that the walls of our trachea um, which are very, very highly sensitive to irritation. They become, um, there's little receptors in there that become stimulated. It causes a reflex within our central nervous system. Um, once we cough, it pushes that air through the bronchial tree um, and it clears the airway from any foreign material that can be in there. And it's kind of the same way for the sneeze. There's little receptors that are in the nasal cavity. Any foreign material will be sneezed out from the force of the sneeze. So our lower respiratory tract, it is composed of the smallest bronchioles and our alveoli. Um, they consider the lower respiratory tract the functional unit of the lungs. That's what we refer to it as. Um, and this is where in the alveoli, we see gas exchange. That's where that's going to happen. It's going to occur in the little alveoli, which are those little tree-like, um, those little flower-like things on the end of the bronchi that open to bring in all that oxygen into our lungs. So these are the structures in our respiratory membrane. Again, I grabbed this from your book. You guys can go ahead and read about that. So some of the um, things that we can see that can occur in our respiratory tract are um, the common cold. So um, the common cold, there are just a variety of different viruses that invade that upper respiratory tract. Um, once those viruses get in that area, they're going to release histamine and prostaglandins. And when those are released, it's going to cause an inflammation and um, an inflammatory response in the upper respiratory tract. Once we start that inflammatory response, we're going to see sinus pain, nasal congestion, um, sneezing, watery eyes, runny nose, scratchy throat, and even a headache. So that's the common cold. We can also, people can also experience what we call seasonal rhinitis. So that is just an inflammation of the nasal cavity. Again, that inflammation is going to cause nasal congestion, stuffiness, um, watery eyes, sneezing. We can also experience sin, um, sinusitis. So sinusitis is going to occur when um, that epithelial lining inside of our sinus cavity becomes inflamed. 
that swelling is going to cause pain because it pushes pressure up against the bone um, and which obviously can't stretch. So it's going to lead to a blockage in that sinus passageway. So many people that have sinusitis will complain of pain in the face where their sinuses are. So we have some in here, they'll report tenderness to touch um, over the eye sometimes. So that's sinusitis. So pharyngitis and laryngitis, these are usually caused by bacteria or viruses. Um, we see this very commonly with the flu. Um, there's a lot of different um, viruses that can produce that. Um, these side effects can be, uh, these symptoms rather can be a little bit more um, uncomfortable than the other ones that we've talked about. So we might see fever with this. We might see um, muscle aches, pains, you know, extreme tiredness, malaise, that kind of thing. Lower respiratory issues that we can see, we can see atelectasis. Um, we can see pneumonia and we can see bronchitis. So atelectasis is when we have a collapse of um, lung tissue that used to be once expanded. So sometimes we will see um, atelectasis with people who get pneumonia in the hospital from not moving. Um, we can see this on x-ray. We can see it um, for people that have had surgeries and for any type of injury to the chest where they're not really able to take those good deep breaths in. Um, and so what happens is, um, we can also see it if, like I have written on your slide, um, some kind of blockage in the airway or if there's that outside pressure against the alveoli. If you have pneumonia, that pushes, pushes the pressure on them as well. It, puts, um, it can also um, create a wet environment inside the lungs and those alveoli can be pushed down from the fluid. That can also cause it. Um, it is um, pneumonia is another one that we talked about. Um, inflammation of the lungs, that's the definition of pneumonia. We know that pneumonia can have bacterial causes and viral causes. Um, we can also see it with aspiration of foreign materials into the lower respiratory tract. So um, it could be medicine that we aspirate on. It could be food or liquid. So for our patients who have um, swallowing disorders or patients that have had strokes, they're always at a high risk for developing aspiration pneumonia because they may cough or and choke on their food. Um, so what we're going to see is we're going to see that um, exudate, um, the engorgement, localized swelling in the lungs. And then for bronchitis, so bronchitis is what we consider by definition a narrowed airway during that inflammation process. So everything becomes swelled up and all those little airways become very narrow. We can't get a lot of good air in there. So this could have bacterial um, reasons. It could be caused by a virus. It also could be some type of a foreign material um, that got in there that infects that um, inner lining of the bronchi. So then we have our obstructive pulmonary diseases. So this is going to be your asthma, your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is COPD, your cystic fibrosis, and your respiratory distress syndrome. So asthma is going to be characterized usually by recurrent. Asthma is something that we see that happens frequently. It's going to be recurrent, reversible episodes of that bronchospasm. And we know that bronchospasm is when the um, bronchial muscles spasm and when they spasm, they cause that, aero, that area to be very narrow and then the airway becomes further obstructed. So usually with asthma, um, it happens. It's not just a one and done. Most people, um, this occurs throughout their life. And then we know that these episodes are reversible. So sometimes we refer to them as exacerbations but eventually they take their medicine. Sometimes they have to go to the hospital, they need oxygen, but they do recover, so reversible. COPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, this is a um, disease that does not, um, is not really reversible. Um, exacerbations can be, um, but it is a progressive disease. Cystic fibrosis is a hereditary disease that results in the accumulation of very 
thick amounts of mucus and these thick secretions in the lungs. Eventually, these thick secretions are going to build up and they're going to cause obstructions in the airway. And they're going to also, um, over time, destruct that lung tissue that we have. And then we have respiratory distress syndrome. So this is a disorder that we see very commonly in our small babies, um, especially those premature neonates. Their lungs haven't had time to mature yet, and they are missing that surfactant that they need. That surfactant is key to helping keep those airways open and allow for proper respiration. All right, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So it is a progressive, not completely reversible. Remember I said, well, sometimes they can have these exacerbations and then they'll go back to their baseline. Um, so it's progressive, not completely reversible, chronic obstruction of that airway. The biggest thing we see this related to is cigarette smoke. Um, it's actually caused by two related disorders. Um, it can also come from emphysema and chronic bronchitis, both of them can also be caused by cigarette smoke. They, both of those conditions, the emphysema and the bronchitis, they will cause that airflow obstruction on expiration. So when we're breathing out, um, as well as we, we cause an ink, they, we, this disease will cause an increase in the inflammation of the lungs. And when we get too overinflated in our lungs, that's when we see that poor gas exchange. So emphysema is caused by elastic, the loss of that elastic tissue that we see in our lungs. It also causes destruction of those alveolar walls. We know a lot of gas exchange happens in there. Um, because of the loss of elasticity in the lungs and that destruction of those alveolar walls, we see this permanent um, inflation um, inside the lungs. And there is a tendency for that to collapse when they expire. Chronic bronchitis is also a permanent inflammation of the airways, but with that, we see a lot of mucus, um, a lot of mucus secretion, um, edema, and then they have poor inflammatory defenses as well. So asthma, asthma is going to be that disorder that is recurrent and reversible episodes of that bronchospasm. The bronchospasm causes that narrowed or obstructed airways. Um, it can be triggered by allergens, um, inhaled irritants. Um, sometimes we see it with emotions. People have anxiety attacks when they get upset about something. Can have, it can cause asthma. Or we can see exercise-induced asthma, where people get asthma and they need inhalers when they're exercising. Um, it does cause an immediate release of histamine. Once that histamine is released, it will cause bronchospasm in about 10 minutes. Um, we do see this later response that will happen. Um, that later response is cytokine mediated. Um, what's gonna happen is we're gonna see inflammation, we're gonna see an increase in mucus production and edema. All three of those are gonna further contribute to that obstruction. That later response is gonna be about three to five hours after um, that immediate release of histamine. So the histamine and these cytokine, cytokine mediated inflammation reactions will both lead to that um, construct obstruction. And cystic fibrosis, this is a hereditary disease. Um, with this disease, we see very large amounts of these thick mucousy secretions um, that accumulate in the lungs. Eventually, this accumulating um, secretions will obstruct the airways and it is going to destruct our lung tissue. And then our respiratory distress syndrome. We do see this frequently in premature infants who lack that um, sufficient surfactant level so that they can breathe on their own. Um, what surfactant does is it lowers the surface tension inside those little alveoli, so it helps them to stay open and allows all that gas exchange to happen. Um, so if those levels are low, our little alveoli will not expand. If they can't expand, they can't receive that air. We don't receive that air, our gas exchange is gonna be decreased. We're gonna have low oxygen levels. And then we're gonna see that stress passed on throughout the rest of our body because we know how important it is for our cells to get that oxygen rich blood. We need that in order to survive. So we're gonna talk about some of the drugs that we use that act on our upper respiratory system. So we can give 
patients antitussives. So a few of the antitussives are um, benzonetate, codeine, dexomethorphan, high, and hydrocodone. So these medications will act directly on the cough center inside of our brain. It's gonna decrease the cough reflex. Um, we would wanna use this for patients who have a non-productive cough that is very annoying, that we could help control that cough. We don't want to use these in a patient who has a productive cough because we want to get that cough. We want to get that stuff out. We want to get that mucus out. Um, so we have to use these cautiously. We need to, we don't always want to suppress the cough because if we can't, if we suppress the cough and there's stuff in there that needs to come out, it's not going to get out and it's going to stay in there and create that wet, warm environment where it can learn to lead to a further um, development of infection. So we use this to control the non-productive cough. It is rapidly absorbed um, and metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. So again, contraindicated for our patients who need to have a cough to maintain their airway. Um, also for people that have had a head injury or um, they have a, an impaired CNS you know, central nervous system. We would not want to use with patients who have a hypersensitivity to any of these medications. Um, and we want to be careful with those people who have a history of addiction because some of these medications can be very habit forming. So that might not be the best choice for them. Um, adverse effects, sometimes they can have a drying effect on the mucous membranes. Some patients may report restlessness, headache, drowsiness, sedation. So we're going to be monitoring that respiratory system. Um, and, our, and our vitals, um, and sometimes patients will report GI upset. We have our topical nasal decongestants. So this is your Afrin, which you guys have probably heard of, um, phenolephrine, tetrahydrolazine, um, yeah, that second one, oxo metazoline, um, budesimide, flunisolide, flucanazone, trimicolone. These are all the medications that are your topical nasal decongestants. Um, they have a sapanthomimetic effect. So they affect our sympathetic nervous system and they cause vasodilation. When we cause vasodilation, it's going to cause less inflammation of that nasal membrane and it's going to help in um, improve their breathing. So we would use this to relieve um, discomfort from nasal congestion that comes from your seasonal allergies, your science, sinusitis, the common cold, things like that. Um, generally, they're not absorbed systemically. Um, any a portion of these um, topical decongestions that is absorbed is going to be metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. We would not want to use in a patient who has um, a lot of issues inside their nose, if they have any current lesions in there, any ulcers, any kind of erosion going on in the mucous membranes, you would want to be very cautious about that. Um, any condition that could exacerbate sympathetic activity, we want to be cautious because we did say this was a... Um, these have sympathetic nervous system effects. Um, depending on where we put this locally, the patient could experience stinging or burning. We could have what we um, ex what some people experience is that rebound congestion. So instead of things getting better, they actually get worse. We see um, um, that that congestion will worsen. And then again, those sapanthomimetic effects. Um, if patients are taking cyclopropane or halothane um, in combination with those topical decongestants that we talked about, we can see serious cardiovascular effects, so issues with the heart. And then our oral decongestants, um, pseudephedrine, which is your triaminic allergy congestion. There's a couple, and there's a lot of other products over the counter that are all combined products, um, but pseudephedrine is actually um, usually kept behind the counters at the pharmacy. They don't leave it out anymore. Um, you do have to show a license to get it. So what these medications do is they will help to um, shrink the nasal mucous membranes and um, 
decrease the inflammation. So we would want to do this to promote drainage of the sinuses, which will help improve airflow. So they are well absorbed, widely distributed through the body. They're gonna be metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. We would not give to any patient who um, has any condition that could be exacerbated by that sympathetic um, activity in the body. Again, rebound congestion we can see with these patients. Um, those sympathetic effects that we were talking about, so this is your glaucoma, your hypertension, um, diabetes, thyroid disease, coronary artery disease, some prostate problems. So you just wanna be careful with these patients. Um, and then we want to be very careful with the over-the-counter products that they're using, um, because if they're having a couple, if they're grabbing, you know, a product for this and a product for that, sometimes they can overdose and see those um, serious side effects because both of those over-the-counter medications or all of them that they take, however many they're taking, contain that active ingredient. So we do want to educate them about that. So our antihistamines, so we have first generation antihistamines and second generation antihistamines. Your first generations, which you will um, recognize is your diphenhydramine, which is your Benadryl and your promethazine, which is Benergan. Our second generations are gonna be your Zyrtex, your Claritins and your Allegra. These should all sound familiar to you. So first generation antihistamines are known to have a greater anticholinergic effect. Um, so they're going to cause drowsiness. Um, so these patients that need to be alert, if they're working during the day, if they're caring for children, driving cars, um, we would probably want to give them a second generation because these are less sedating than the first generation. Um, second generations can be sedating um, as well, but not to the degree as the first generation. So they're definitely a better choice. So um, what these medications do, whoops, is they will um, block histamine at that histamine receptor site, which is gonna decrease that allergic response. Um, they have anticholinergic and antipyretic effects. So we would use these for our seasonal and perennial allergy rhinitis, um, allergic conjunctivitis and um, hives, and we can use it also for angioedema, so swelling in the face. So these medications are well absorbed in, um, metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine. We would want to use cautiously in patients who are pregnant or lactating. Um, we're gonna monitor that renal and hepatic function um, for patients that have a history of arrhythmias. We have to use um, these medications cautiously. So AFib, A flutter, things like that. Um, we know that they can cause drowsiness and sedation. We can see those anticholinergic effects. So we've guys have, we have talked about many medications about and we talked about anticholinergic. So I do expect you guys to know what our um, what those signs and symptoms would be. And then there's a lot of different drug interactions depending on what type of drug you're, you're taking. Um, so we, it would be more specific to exactly what that medication is. And then we have our expectorants. So these increase our um, productive cough to get the, to get the um, secretions out to help clear that airway. They help liquefy those lower respiratory tract secretions. Um, it makes it easier, thins them out and makes them easier for the patient to cough them up. So this is your Mucinex and there are a couple other medications out there. Um, so we would use this for symp um, symptomatic relief of those respiratory conditions characterized by that non-productive cough. So we know something's there, we can feel it, but we can't get anything up. Um, it's gonna be rapidly absorbed, metabolized, um, and excreted has, um, how it's metabolized or how it's excreted, we, there's nothing been reported about that. Adverse effects. So these medications come with a few. So GI symptoms, the most common nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Patients can also experience a headache, dizziness, a rash. Um, and then we know that patients that stay on this for an extended period of time um, can cause a masking of other serious underlying disorders. So, you know, we know that sometimes patients that have a non-productive cough for quite some time, it doesn't improve. This has been known to be, um, in some patients, it could be diagnosed 
um, after investigation as lung cancer. So some people that have lung cancer have this non-productive cough that just starts out of nowhere and nothing clears it up. So if we're taking these medications to um, help with that cough, but we're not really addressing what's going on, then something more serious could be going on and we might not know it. So we don't wanna use, they shouldn't be using these medications for an overextended amount of time without communicating with their doctors. So then we have mucolytics. So this is um, our acetyl yeah, acetylcysteine or Dornase, which is also um, called Pulmazyme. So these medications will work to break down the mucus um, to help um, patients get up these very thick, um, disgusting secretions that they have trapped in there. Um, sometimes we see this in patients that have COPD, um, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, sometimes tuberculosis. So we would give these to patients who, whoever's having difficulty getting up those secretions. Um, also for patients who have developed atelectasis, um, patients that are undergoing a bronchoscopy where they go in and they look in that area of the lungs. Um, for our post-operative patients who we know are at risk for developing um, pneumonia, and then our patients with tracheostomies. So these medications are directly, um, they go into the trachea or they are received by a nebulizer treatment. Um, we would want to be careful with our patients who are suffering with acute bronchospasm. Um, if they have any peptic ulcer or any um, esophageal varices, because they're at risk for bleeding. So these adverse side effects that we see are GI upset, um, rash, bronchospasm it can cause, and then rhinorrhea, which is that runny nose, and stomatitis, which is those stores inside the mouth. So I did include these. You can, I got these from the internet. You guys can take a look at these. Um, so this I grabbed from your book. This is a good slide. This shows you the act of the site of action of the drugs that are working on that upper respiratory tract, where they work and how they affect things. Um, and here's a nice little picture right here of all your little alveoli in your lung. Um, they're very little, but they serve such a big purpose and they really do help with that gas exchange. And what happens is when patients have atelectasis or they get pneumonia. So if you have atelectasis, these won't open up like they're supposed to. They're gonna become, sometimes they get pneumonia and they get weighed down, they become very heavy and they can't pop open and get that good lung exchange in. So when we're giving patients um, a stenospirometer and we're teaching them to breathe in, what happens is by doing that movement, that inhalation, it's causing these little um, um, alveoli right, right here to pop open. And if they pop open, then they can get that good oxygen in. So those incentive spirometers, the turn, cough, deep breathe, all of those are very important exercises to prevent um, pneumonia and to help our patients who have respiratory issues. And this is just another slide that I grabbed from the internet. You guys can take a look at that. So we also give our patients bronchodilators or some people call them anti-asthmatics. So these are medications that will work by helping to increase our respirations by um, dilating our airways. So they can offer symptomatic relief or prevention of um, bronchoasthma and for that bronchospasm that we see with COPD. So helpful in symptomatic relief or prevention. So some of our bronchodilators, we're gonna have them um, sepantho, um, memetics, we have anticholinergics, and we have our um, anthemes. So our sepantho memetics, these are gonna be drugs that will mimic the effects of the central, um, the sympathetic nervous system. So these medications, um, you may have heard of some of these, albuterol, ephedrine, rovana, I've actually never given that, EpiPen, which is epinephrine, we give this a lot for anaphylactic reactions, Foradil, Arcapta, um, Isopril, and Terbutaline. A couple of them, I've actually heard of them, some of them I haven't. Um, how do these medications work? Most of these medications are what we call beta-2 selective 
adrenergic agonist. We've already talked about this very early in our semester. Um, at our at therapeutic levels, their actions are going to be very specific to those beta two receptors that are found inside the bronchi at therapeutic levers levels above and below. We know that it's not going to be good. It's not going to be helpful. Um, we would give these to patients who are having um, acute asthma attacks, patients that have bronchospasms. So it could be um, chronic if they have chronic asthma or if they're just having an exacerbation and they are just having an acute, um, um, an acute um, attack at that present time. And then we can use it to prevent that exercise induced asthma that we talked about that some people get when they go to the gym and they work out or some students get this when they work out and they play high school sports. So we can take this to prevent it. So um, after these medications, if they're injected, they're going to be rapidly distributed, they're going to be um, transformed in our liver and excreted in our urine. We would not want to um, give to um, certain people, just depending on the severity of their underlying conditions. There's a lot of different variants with a lot of different medication, medications. I just want you to know that there is contraindications with every medication. Um, adverse side effects is the sapanthomimetic stimulation, central nervous system stimulation, and then we can see GI upset. We can see the development of cardiac arrhythmias. Um, they might develop hypertension. You might see that bronchospasm sweating, paler, flushing. Um, and we know that these medications do interfere with some general anesthetics. So we just have to be careful with them. And that's another one that I grabbed from, your, from the internet. You guys can look at that. You might find those useful. So the anathenes, these are um, caffeine um, and theophylline are the two um, main ones that we see. Um, we can get these, we can get the caffeine and the theophylline from a variety of different sources that are naturally occurring. Um, we do use these medications to treat respiratory diseases. They will act on the smooth muscle in our respiratory tract. Um, we have smooth muscle in the bronchi and in our blood vessels, so it's going to help relax those, um, which is going to increase the, um, the vital capacity that we have in our lung. Um, our vital capacity becomes diminished because of that bronchospasm or because we get air trapped in there sometimes. Um, and it's going to decrease that bronchial swelling and decrease that narrowing that we see. So we're going to relax everything, open everything up, and then we will be able to breathe again. So they are going to be rapidly absorbed in the GI tract. Um, we should be careful with people who have GI issues. Um, Anybody that has a history of coronary artery disease, patients who already are suffering with some type of respiratory dysfunction, we just have to use cautiously. Patients with renal or hepatic diseases, um, alcoholism, because we know that's further gonna cause problems with the liver, um, and patients that have hyperthyroidism because these medications can exacerbate these symptoms. Um, the effects that we use, adverse effects are usually associated with the um, blood levels of the theophylline. So we have to monitor these levels. We wanna make sure that they're, that they're always at a therapeutic level so that they're not too low, that they're not working and that they're not toxic. Um, so usually when those levels start to rise, we do see some pretty predictable adverse side effects. We can see, um, stomach upset, we can see that patients get irritable, sometimes we have tachycardia, um, nausea, brain damage, um, seizures can even occur, and then even death, obviously, the more toxic levels they become. So these are the um, serum levels. So less than or equal to 20 um, is pretty uncommon. Um, we won't see any side effects at those levels. Less than or equal to 20 to 25, we are gonna see probably, sorry, there's a misspelling there, um, diarrhea, um, insomnia, 
headache, irritability, nausea, vomiting. Um, and then when those levels reach greater than 30 to 35, that's when we're gonna see those pretty serious issues. So increased blood sugar, hyperglycemia, hypotension, low blood pressure, cardiac arrhythmias, um, tachycardia, which is that increased heart rate, seizures, brain damage, and then death is possible. So because of the way that these medications are metabolized in the liver, um, these drugs can act with other medications in this category. Um, and I have that written twice, sorry. Um, we want to use very carefully in patients who are um, deciding to decrease the amount that they smoke or discontinue smoking altogether because we do see that these levels can become, um, those levels can increase and the patients can be tox um, can de develop toxicity um, if they say, hey, I'm going to quit smoking and they stop altogether or they decrease rapidly the amount of cigarettes that they are smoking. We have our anticholinergics. This is our Atrovent and our Spiriva. So for patients who cannot take those effects that we see with the sapanthomimetics, um, we can give them the anticholinergic drug. So these are not as effective as those sapanthomimetics, but if they're having trouble tolerating them, this is another good choice. So these anticholinergics will block um, those mediated um, reflexes by antagonizing the action of that acetylcholine in the body. Um, normally, we have a vagal stimulation in our body, which will um, cause a, um, a stimulating type of an effect on our smooth muscle, which causes contract contractions. If we're able to block that vagal effect, we can relax the smooth muscle um, in the bronchi, which is gonna lead to bronchodilation. And if we have bronchodilation, we know that our patients are gonna breathe better and we're gonna be able to get that um, air in better. So indications, we see this for a lot of patients who have COPD or patients that are suffering with bronchospasms. So the onset of these um, medications is very quickly. You guys need to know this. So if they have a very rapid onset and a very long duration. Because of that, they can only be they can be taken once a day, um, which is good for compliance. Um, the less amount of time that people are expected to take things, the more compliant they are. Um, the onset of action when it's inhaled is about 15 minutes. We're going to see that these medications peak in one to two hours, and the duration of um, action is about three to four hours. We want to use cautiously in any condition that could that could be aggravated by um, anticholinergic effects. Um, adverse effects are going to be related to whatever drug we're giving them. Um, some of the adverse effects are dizziness, headache, fatigue, nervousness, dry mouth, sore throat, palpitations, um, and then urinary retention. So these are your um, anticholinergic effects. You guys can look at that. Then we have our steroids that are inhaled. So this is going to be your budesonide, which is your pulmacort, your um, flow vent, your trimicolone. We have Brio Ellipta. Brio Ellipta combines a steroid with those long acting um, medications. Um, that's one of the medications, the Brio that we see in the hospitals a lot. Um, inhaled steroids work very, very well for bronchospasm. They help decrease the inflammatory response inside the airway. So we can give these medications for the prevention and treatment of asthma. Um, we can treat chronic steroid dependent um, bronchial asthma. So for your patients that are chronically on these steroids, um, they need them because it's a recurrent chronic issue for them. Um, they're gonna be observed well in the respiratory tract. They are gonna be metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine. So we will not use these medications for emergency um, or during an acute attack, acute asthma attack or a status elliptic. We're gonna use our stronger medications. And then we have to use cautiously in our patients who are pregnant or lactating. And then some of the serious side effects that we see, we can see sore throat, hoarseness, coughing, dry mouth. Um, 
We can also see that these patients develop pharyngeal and laryngeal fungal infections. So there is a process to taking some of these in, inhaled steroids. We always wanna make sure that the patient, after they take them, they rinse their mouth very well after they use that inhaler because that's gonna help um, decrease the systemic absorption and it's gonna help reduce the risk of them developing that oral thrush, with thrush which is the, um, Hold on a second. All right, guys, sorry about that. Um, so you do wanna make sure that you have that patient rinse their mouth after, that use their, after they use that inhaler. Um, it's gonna decrease the systemic absorption and it's gonna reduce, reduce the risk of them getting oral thrush, which is a fungal infection. And it can also decrease that risk of GI upset and them getting nausea. Oops, sorry guys, I forgot to bring that back up. And that is it for week 14. You are officially done with your last lecture for your first semester of nursing school. So proud of you guys. You guys have done great this semester. Um, I will go ahead. I've already posted a um, Jeopardy review for you, and I will post another review before your exam sometime this week. But if you have any questions, you can email me. Have a good night.